we start using all our yard waste to make biofuel, what are we going to do for compost? That is a great question. And you'll have compost. Lots of compost because once we get the oil out of it, we got to do something with that waste. And so it, go, it actually is broken down further than what you get for compost. So it's ready to go in your garden and you don't even have to let it sit around or, or sit for a year or so. You can just put it right in. Um, there's the, the, the oil process, that's the great part about using the waste, is that we don't interrupt the waste stream. We just get a product out of it before we get to break it down and, and put it somewhere else. And by breaking it down completely, the food waste doesn't get smelly or stinky or sitting in a big pile somewhere waiting to be broken down. Um, regarding biodiesel and um, locally produced vegetable oil, you know, waste oil, biodiesel versus commercially produced, grown in other countries and such, what do you see the public's knowledge level of that as far as the differences? Um, I know a lot of people are just, oh, biodiesel, if they see a gas station, they think that's good. What is your perception of the public's knowledge level of the differences? That's a good question. There is, what is the public knowledge? The public knowledge is very little. Um, they just see biodiesel and they think it's good. Um, and they don't, we don't know where stuff comes from. We're spoiled. We put the fuel in our tank and we take off. Um, we assume it's good quality fuel because it's being sold. We assume that it's, it's green if it's biodiesel or has the word bio on it. We assume that it's got good economic practices, and we assume a lot. It's the, the public needs to be informed that using it from waste oil is putting the money back into society, our own society, and getting biodiesel from waste oil is right now the best economical, feasible way of doing it, and most greenest, because we get three, 15 times energy return out of our bio, biodiesel that way. If you do it from plant food production, you only get about a three times energy return. And the money's going to multinational corporations and shipped all around. So you're basically feeding the petroleum company if you go for the you know, plant-based biodiesel. Hi, so I have one of those stupid questions that people said was not too stupid, but in my defense, I don't drive, so I don't really go to gas stations, but where can you get biodiesel? Is it in every gas station? Currently, the state of Washington is mandating a 2% in biodiesel in your diesel fuel. Biodiesel solves the low centane value, the low sulfur diesel, so you can pretty much get biodiesel anywhere. Um, Seaport sells B100, so you can drive down there and pick up you know, a B100. They have a mixing tank, so you can select your grade of a 20%, 50%, or 100%. And that's just, I believe, right down on, um, right down in West Seattle, right, um, I'm not too familiar with the Seattle area, but it's on uh, Magnolia, I believe. Some right in Ballard, too, as well. Some in Ballard, too, as well. And that's not a stupid question. It's a very good question, because I'm sure those of us that want to get it, Need to know where. I guess I have two questions um, that are related. Inter are you saying that right now we can use cellulose and yeast to make biodiesel? And then the other question is, if that's true, what is the cost, you know, per gallon using that technique? Because I, I thought it was like this was way off into the future. The sh the the question is, is, can we use yeast to make biodiesel? And what's the cost? Cellulose. Yes, we can use yeast. The cost? I'm a scientist. I'm sorry. I don't know the real cost. Um, but it's just fermentation. It's, it's how we make our beer. If you're all drinking beer tonight and, and you can pay a little bit for beer, it's, not gonna, it's no different in the technology. I mean, we can brew lots of beer. We can brew lots of biodiesel. Um, it's... it's no different in how you make it and feed it and whatever. This is the study. This, this study actually came out of China. Um, and it's, it's, this is real. This is not some made up thing. And these are the real numbers they got. With optimized conditions, they got a 60% yield of lipids. 
which out of the bacteria, and, it, and if you take the, and resulting in 23.41 grams per liter. So yeast are grown in a liquid medium. So for every liter, you get 23 grams of, of, of fluid, which it, of, of biodiesel itself that you can make. And if you, the 60% comes from the yeast itself. If you extract the yeast, it's a very small amount of the liquid itself. Um, but as you extract it, you can grow more. Like I was saying, yeast doubling time is 20 minutes. So if you start off with one yeast cell, it doubles to two. It then again doubles to four. So you get four yeast cells from one yeast cell in one hour. Um, doubling time from algae is four hours. So it takes 16, 12 hours to do what yeast did in one hour for algae. So that's one of the great things about yeast. It's very efficient. But like I said, algae itself can work too. But um, there's a story out there, the guy that paid $500 for one gallon of algae oil, it cost him that much to produce one gallon of algae oil, and it wasn't very high quality oil. So all of this takes properly applied technology and properly applied science to make it inexpensive. Uh, what's your opinion of um, other thermochemical conversion pathways like uh, pyrolysis or gasification in comparison to uh, like the you know biochemical fermentation pathways like uh, my impression of fermentation is that it's s slower in comparison to some of these thermochemical pathways the question is about pyrolysis which is it, for the non-science people, pyrolysis is just basically a lot of heat converting the chemical into another chemical. Um, and that's the problem. It's a lot of heat. It's a lot of energy um, and very costly to set up. Um, there is a great process. We are looking into it where you convert, uh, we're converting our glycerin through that process into acrylic acid, plexiglass. It takes 500 degrees Fahrenheit of heat to do that. That is a lot of energy. So the product has to be a high value product. It costs a lot of energy to make it, so it has to cost a lot of money to sell it. With fermentation process, well, you all you all drink Bud Light that's 50 cents a can. Um, yeast can be produced even cheaper than that. It's a it's a very it's a long process. It takes time, but if you set it up right, and with a large space, it takes lots of space and lots of time but you're working in cubic feet for, for yeast and bacteria. So unlike algae where you have to have square feet or growing food, you have square feet. How many square feet of land do you have? How many square feet of, of growing area do you have for algae? With yeast, you have cubic feet. If you take the cubic feet of this room, we have a lot of space. Question? Did I hear you right that uh you can put up to 6% ethanol in your engine without a modification. Uh, and then I have okay. something to follow up with. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure I read on a gas pump that um, the, it said this fuel contains up to 10% ethanol. So can you reconcile those two? Well, 10% is just what we are supposed to put in. And the question is, did you hear me right, that we can do 60%? Yes, Australia is currently doing 60%. Oh, you said 60. 60. Oh, I thought you said 60. No, 60%. Oh, it's a misunderstanding. You thought I said 6. We can put 60% ethanol into our engine with no modification. You get less power, and, and you get some fouling of your plugs after a while. You get you got to change things out, but you can do it. Um, now, do I recommend doing it all the time? No. Um, modification of the injectors is what's needed, especially fuel injected engines. Um, from your point of view, what's the biggest limiting factor in more widespread use of biodiesel? One word for the limiting use of biodiesel is feedstock. How much can, I mean, what is our consumption? 64 billion gallons of diesel fuel in, in the United States alone. We don't have that much feedstock. We have to change the way we do things if we want to go completely bio on, on our thing. Um, it can mitigate. N it's not a solution. It's an answer for the short term. Um, 
we have to come up with solutions over for the long term. And when I mean short term, it's good for 30, 50 years. And then we're going to come up with something better. Science is always evolving, always changing. I'm sure 50 years ago, the, the idea of running out of oil was almost obsolete. This is one of the things that I'm obsessed with but haven't had any chance to research yet, and that is when are we going to start mining our landfills for resources, and are the resources that are in landfills from the last 100 years going to be worth anything from your perspective for biodiesel or other fuels? It's a very good question. When are we going to mine our waste streams that we currently have? The current landfills are not going to be any good for really fuels. They're going to be good for compost because they've been broken down. Um, they're going to be good for iron and, and um, you know, the material minerals that we've thrown away, especially aluminum, because it's, it takes 800 times more energy to extract aluminum than it is to recycle. So I hope you all recycling your aluminum cans. But, um, yeah, the, the, w the landfills are our, one of our biggest issues, and the biggest thing we can tap in our landfills right now is the methane gas production. Most of the methane gas production in our landfills is just being burned off at night. And by capturing that gas and using it for production of, of electricity would save us a lot of money and a lot of energy. You had a chart up there showing the tons of waste coming out of the city per year. How much biodiesel would that generate? And also, if you had a a vat the size of this room full of yeast, how much biodiesel would that generate per year? Now you're asking me to do math. <laughs> um, well, I can tell you the short answer. It's about 40 million gallons from our waste stream right there. Per year, we could produce 40 million gallons from our waste just in the city of Seattle. And what's the yeast that's in Seattle? <laughs> uh, that is a good question. I don't know the answer. I think probably... The question is, what's the usage of diesel fuel in Seattle? Metro bus alone uses 18 million gallons. The state fuel fairly is the equivalent to that. And the Washington State all together uses a billion gallons. Well, Washington State uses a billion gallons of fuel is the answer to that. How much fuel do we use? Diesel fuel is a billion gallons annu annually. So 35 million gallons is not fixing the problem. It is helping it, but it's not fixing it. This room, um, well, if we go back to the chart here, you, you get a 60% yield from food waste. So if this room was filled with yeast, and you, you'd have to figure out the liters and cubic feet and everything, and I don't have all the numbers for that. So, But you could produce um, probably, if you use this size room for a bioreactor, you'd be looking at around 2 million, maybe 3 million gallons a year you could produce. if you could talk about the how biodiesel burns um, if I took a liter of biodiesel compared it to a liter of regular diesel um, how, how do the emissions compare and I guess also given that um, maybe you have to use more than one liter of biodiesel um, are you still having any gains on improved emissions If I understand the question right, you're asking me, how does emissions improve with biodiesel, and is it actually is it a positive emission improvement? The short answer is there's no difference, really. I mean, you're going to hear studies on both ends of the of the board that biodiesel's worse, that diesel fuel's worse. The carcinogenic factor, though, for biodiesel is a lot less than that of diesel fuel. So, if you're smelling diesel fumes, you're more likely to get cancer than you are with biodiesel. Uh, that's, uh, that's the biggest thing. The nitrous oxide emissions from biodiesels are higher, but the carbon monoxide emission from diesel fuel is higher. So, I mean, it's kind of a wash when you're looking at the emissions themselves. But if you're looking at what it does for an environmental impact and the human impact, the carcinogenics, there is no carcinogenic factors in biodiesel. The LD50 of biodiesel is four gallons. You have to drink four gallons and then 50% will die. 
That's what LD50 means. 50% of people exposed to it will die. And so, and if anybody's drinking four gallons of biodiesel, we got a lot of other problems than them just drinking bio, biodiesel. 